happy Saturday. Happy spring. I'm so glad that you are tuning in. Um, we are here live to answer your questions about holographic manipulation therapy. If you have questions, post them below and I will do my best to go back and forth and, and find the questions so that you can have your answers. If you are not part of our um, subconscious healer Facebook group, I encourage you to do so. I'll post the link after uh, this live so that you can join that group. We have lots of information that we post in that group, um, announcements, events, um, helpful information. So please join our, our Facebook group, the subconscious healer, and, uh, you know, join a, a, a wonderful community of people wanting to, you know, learn about their traumas as well. All right, so I'm here with my husband, Dr. Gabe Roberts, and we're gonna answer your questions today. Um, let me make sure that I am sharing this everywhere. One second, I wanna make sure that we put it on our Facebook page and our subconscious healer group. Share to the group, okay, great. Okay, I think we've got it shared everywhere. I'm going to put it on your page too, hon. Um, share to a friend. <laughs> All right. Okay. So the first question that we had was from Leslie, and she says, how do we know that we can trust a therapist? It's a good question. That's a, that's a really um, good question. Um, I, I would probably answer this the same way I answer um, occasional people that are asking if this is the right approach for them. If they're, if they're not sure about holographic manipulation therapy, maybe they've tried several other things and, you know, we have a discussion and they're still not sure of if this is the right move. Um, I always tell the person to trust their intuition trust their gut feelings. Um, and I have recently had a um, gentleman tell me I trusted my gut feelings once and it, it gave me a, it led me astray. And I had to correct him right then and there and say, no, I'm afraid you did not listen to your gut feelings because your gut feelings won't lead you astray. We oftentimes listen to our conscious mind, the rational a justifying, um, lying mind of ours that has the voice in our head. It demands the most attention. It actually uh, speaks the loudest to us. It's the one that's constantly playing dialogues over and over inside of our head about, about things. And it's also the one that checks out whenever we have a significant emotional response. So if you notice, if you ever get really stressed out, it just checks right out and we don't even hear it anymore. But that is a lying rational mind. And I know people that uh, tremendously suffer in life because they listen to that part of themselves. Um, I know people that have had uh, horrific accidents because they ignored their gut feelings. They trusted that part of their mind and it, it basically led them right into a state of misery. So the first thing to do, if you're ever sure about, if you're ever um, trying to evaluate if something is correct or a therapist is correct for you, is to just pay attention to those little background feelings, the little subtleties in the background, not the rational mind. Oftentimes people will have an intuition that, oh, I don't know if this is right for me. Uh, a great example is if they start a new relationship with someone and their gut feelings is saying, Ooh, that's a red flag. I don't know if I like that. I don't know if I like that. And immediately the conscious mind kicks in and talks you out of listening to that part of yourself. So what happens as a result of ignoring the gut feeling, listening to the rational lying mind, you know, here you are a year, two years, three years into a relationship, and it's actually miserable, uh, perhaps even um, dangerous to your health, physically dangerous, perhaps all because your intuition was giving you the red flags long ago and you ignored it. 
Same goes for the therapist. Same goes for the doctor. I always tell people, trust your intuition and it will always, um, it, it's, it's connected to the web of reality. Your unconscious mind answers first, it answers correctly, and it does not have the capacity to be dishonest. And if you trust that when it comes to someone, if you have just this feeling deep down inside, ah, something's not right. I don't know if I trust this. Something just doesn't feel right. I'm not getting a good vibe. Um, all those are ways of your, your GPS is beeping and telling you that there's warning ahead. Listen to that. Don't listen to the voice in your head that's going to try to rationalize or justify um, you know, the circumstance, because it, it will, um, oftentimes more often than not lead you into misery. If you're not listening to that, that fainter part of yourself. Right. And I think that that is probably the biggest, um, indicator on whether or not you feel like that therapist would be good. Um, also, are they getting the results that you want? Um, cause if right. they're not, then obviously that would be an obvious choice, um, to not go with that person. Are, are there, um, goals and mission in their therapy align with what you feel is necessary? Um, if they're just going to prescribe a drug and if, if you wanted to go holistic, that doesn't mesh well. Right. Um, right. If the so, person, if the person has integrity or not, right. Um, if the person gives you um, one thing we used to interview doctors long ago, and one of the things that was either a red flag for me or a green flag, I guess you could call it where I was okay with it was, would I trust this doctor? Would I trust this professional? Would I trust this person alone with my child in a room for a moment, you know, for a few moments, if you know someone and you would not trust them with your child alone, just you know, because who knows what could happen. They could say something, they could do something. That's a really good indicator that that person is not someone that you would like to associate with. Right. Um, Leslie also says, um, how is this therapy different from standard therapy that most people know about? Uh, many ways. I mean, I could probably talk for an hour on just that alone. Um, one of the, one of the hallmarks of holographic manipulation therapy is its ability to locate the millisecond of overwhelm. So when the first, um, uh, when the first moment of overwhelm occurred, usually between the ages of zero to six, um, that have everything to do with why you're there. There's some reason that you've, you know, um, sought out the person you have sought out the therapist. There's something you're wanting to get resolved. And more often than not, you have no idea where the origination comes from. Uh, and that's the case in about 98% of the time people come in and they have some kind of issue, whether it's pain, whether it's fatigue, whether it's anxiety, uh, whatever it might be. Um, and they don't know the origination of it. Holographic manipulation therapy goes right to the very first time it happened. So it can pinpoint it with, um, you know, incredible accuracy right away. Uh, talk to the nervous system and the neurology in a way in a language that it fully understands. Um, create counter frequencies and counter measures to cancel out all the um, all the fragments of that trauma or that moment of overwhelm. And additionally, um, address any lessons, any kind of experiences that the unconscious mind wants the person to hold on to from that moment. Um, many times, if you don't address any of those, you don't find the millisecond, you don't address all the frequencies, all the fragments of that hologram, and you don't address the safety lessons, um, reoccurrence will happen. It's just a mathematical certainty. If you address all of those, the chances of a person ever reliving that experience again uh, is zero. And what I mean by reliving that experience is we we create our reality. First off, we think that we're just kind of navigating in the here and now, and we're adults that are in charge of our life, but we are not thinking. We are remembering. We're remembering things that have happened to us in the past that we've long lost forgotten. That's buried in the, the deep uh, crevices of the unconscious mind, but show itself as 
little in little um, feelings, little guidances, little annoyances, little triggers that show up. That's the language of the unconscious mind. Uh, for instance, had a gentleman come to me and he had a severe anger problem. And I said, when's the last time you got angry? He said, I hired a guy to fix some things at my house. Um, they weren't fixed. I returned, I went out of town. I came back. They weren't fixed. I said, you know what happened? Um, I got really angry when I got back and nothing was fixed. And I said, okay, that's what happened. But what caused you to get angry? He went right to, he took advantage of me. He lied to me. So out of all the billions of data that our nervous system and his nervous system processes uh, within seconds, his mind and brain went right to, he lied to me, he took advantage of me. Not the possibility that his wife could have gotten a car accident. That's why he didn't fix the things. Uh, not that his kid could have had an accident. Not that he himself could be ill. Out of all these different possibilities that exist, his brain went right to, he lied to me, he took advantage of me. And why is that? That's not an accident. A person's mind and the way they react to any circumstance shows what happened to them first, because our mind is constantly sorting within nanoseconds of our previous experiences of what happened to us. And it creates a, it creates a, a contextual story of how we deal with the present here and now based on our history. So uh, your unconscious mind is constantly navigating uh, using like a, a compass and navigation tools based on what happened first. So when you go back and you change that, you actually give a new history for the nervous system to um, refer back to, and it can actually completely change the perception and ultimately the experience a person has in their life um, in the present day. I was on mute. Okay, perfect. Um, so Taffy is, is stating, um, Dr. Peter Bregan uh, has helped countless patients without the use of psych psychiatric drugging. He says he is able to help even those with psychosis. Is there a way to integrate this type of care with this so that people with psychosis can be helped as well? Um, you know, and we were discussing this earlier, I really think that that is what we do because um, getting rid of the, the trauma within your hologram and your nervous system, you revert back to what humans really are meant to be is love with empathy and compassion and happiness. Uh, can you maybe expel upon that? Right, so Dr. Peter's work is successful uh, in the same ways that holographic manipulation therapy is because it allows the individual to um, obtain the emotional needs that were not met at the time. So Dr. Peter's work, if I'm not mistaken, uh, his approach is connection and, and love and empathy for others and things like that. Um, and basically what you're doing is you're, you're meeting the need, a biological necessity that humans have. Uh, more often than not, whenever a person is traumatized, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, battlefields or, um, you know, really, really extreme situations with substance abuse or things like that. It certainly can, but more often than not, it's an emotional need that wasn't met. It's, um, you know, a child was trying to say something to a parent at a particular time and they were ignored or uh, a child hurt themselves and was crying, expressing a need. And the parent had a different priority. Um, I've, I've seen people that are, um, you know, develop breast tumors and things like that, because you go back to the first time, the feeling that has everything to do with what caused that. And it's a, it's a little girl getting hurt and bawling in pain. And the mother was more concerned about making dinner for the guests. Um, you know, boom, that's an, that's an, a neglect. That's an emotional need not being met in that younger, I think she was maybe four or five at the time. And now it stems as an emotional need not being met and just catapults more and more and more into manifesting as, you know, physical lesions on an adult woman. So what our work is based on and what his work is based on is meeting those emotional needs of the children that weren't met at the time and their absolute 
biological necessities. And when that happens, there's a, a state of harmony and the body begins to heal because it's getting what it needs. Uh, it's getting those needs met. Um, and this brings up something that, you know, we're going to be talking about in our um, five day child challenge that I am creating uh, within the next couple of weeks. But um, as a mom that is, you know, always busy, always um, making sure the household is running, doing the homeschooling, making sure that everyone in the house is, is fine, um, you feel a little stretched. And maybe the, the child um, isn't feeling that connection. I already know the answer, but could you tell us what's one connection um, that a child could actually feel that doesn't really take a lot of time. Um, and I'm, I'm basically saying, you know, that um, the connection with the mom and, and the child or even the dad and the child when they're sitting next to you. I would say um, ensure that you have the intuition. In other words, you feel it in your heart, you feel it in your gut. Mm -hmm. You're not just, you're not just, you know, going through the motions, but you actually feel this where you're welcoming them in your mm -hmm. presence, um, where you have a joy because they're in your presence. See, children pick up much more on things than we give them credit for, uh, especially when they're zero to six. Um, their interoception is just um, incredibly revved up to where they feel things. Okay. They can feel the energy of people much more. Uh, by the time we're adult, we've ignored that so long that those uh, emotional muscles uh, have a trophy. Okay. Um, their mirror neurons are extremely hungry. In other words, they can pick up everything going on and they can absorb uh, an, just an insatisfiable amount of data. So if you're there with a child and your, your intuition, your focus on everything you're doing is having joy because they're there, they'll pick up on that right away. And you'll see uh, a definite change in their behavior because that connectivity is now being met. That's, that's so much more important than just telling a child you love them because love is completely subjective. And I know of people today, I know of parents today that always say, ah, you know, I love you. I love you. And they, they, they don't have any clue what that is. There's no connectivity there. There's no connection there. Um, so instead of, trying to love the child, welcome their in your presence and have a joy that they're in your presence. Even if it's, even if it's a brief time, that's going to soothe them in a way that um, is very positive in the development of their personality. Yes, that's exactly what I was talking about. Um, and it doesn't take words. It's, it's really, um, you know, like when you're by a horse, you can feel their magnitude of just their presence. That's what we're really talking about. Have that presence within your, your heart that you really want to be with that child. And it could take as little as a minute or two and it changes their world. Right. So um, you mentioned a lot about going back to the age of zero to six. Um, how does that change a person's life today? Okay. Um, I kind of briefly touched on this when we first started today. Um, but the, but we, we create our reality. Okay. Um, we basically, and this is all neuroscience based. Um, we take in a tremendous amount of data and we basically don't even have uh, emotions. Everything we experience as humans starts with a, a feeling state, a body feeling state. And then within nanoseconds, that feeling state, uh, your neurology scans the context of what you're surrounded around, what is going on in that present moment. It goes through your history to look at how you might have had previous experiences similar to this one, looks at how you dealt with that to survive, okay? And then immediately comes up with a, an emotion that is going to drive your behavior in that, in that particular moment. And see, we think that we're having emotions, but what we're not, we're having body feelings and we're remembering something from the history. So 
we are ultimately creating our reality based on what's happened in the past constantly, just like I described with the uh, gentleman and his anger. Okay. He wasn't mad at the person who didn't repair his things. He was mad because at a previous time in his life, a very young age, he was lied to and he was taken advantage of. So now his brain instantly scans for that, looks at that experience that has happened before. And again, creates that reality in front of him when that wasn't the case whatsoever. Nobody lied to him. Nobody took advantage of him. His brain created that reality based on what was there previously, based on what was there first. And this is how all emotions are, whether it's sadness, whether it's guilt, whether it's remorse, whether it's not feeling loved, whether it's feeling that the world is a threatening place. We learn this from somewhere. We learn this from somewhere early on in our childhood, and we're continuously creating that reality based on something that happened first. So when we go back and we have the unconscious mind, which is the only source that knows besides God, we, we have the unconscious mind take us to that, that millisecond of where that was first formed, the most primitive, the most powerful one, when the nervous system was the most plastic and ultimately set in stone, the template, the, the lens of how that person views and interprets life, when we change it there, we change it at that moment. Now the person's perception of life completely changes because again, every experience we have throughout life, throughout the day-to-day -day process, when we're just kind of navigating and doing things, your nervous system is scanning um, huge amounts of data and ultimately creating your reality based on your history and based on events that have happened that you've done in the past. And this is all happening in, in nanoseconds. When you have a different history for your unconscious mind to use as a reference, it completely changes your perception. And so people don't feel threatened suddenly. Uh, they feel like they're loved and accepted. They don't mind being by themselves. Um, they learn to stand their own boundaries. They learn to say no when they should say no without without the feeling of, oh, I've got to hurt this person's feelings and now I'm going to lose that connection and I don't know what I'm going to do if with, without that connection. See, that doesn't even register them anymore. They just say, no, I'm not feeling it today. That's what I'm going to do. And they, they learn to say no when they should say no. And as a result of that, they're creating that reality. Their body is manifesting that and they begin to become much more um, tolerant to things like microbial overgrowth and, and uh, environmental toxins and things like that. So when a person's overwhelmed with toxins, when they're overwhelmed with um, microbes, they're there for a reason. They're there because the person doesn't have healthy boundaries, healthy boundaries on saying no when they should, um, healthy boundaries on and not allowing the people in their life that they shouldn't. Um, as, as I like to put it, if you have parasites coming into your life, you have parasites coming into your body, you're having parasitic, you're having people that have the characteristics of parasites around you as well. Right. I was on mute because <laughs> the dogs are crazy this mm -hmm. morning. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay. So I don't see any more questions that are posted. Would you like to add anything further before we close up today? I can't really think of anything. Um, just, you know, keep in mind that uh, whenever you have a significant emotional state, uh, this is what I always like to tell people, because this is fairly um, new to uh, neuroscience, kind of a, a fairly new discovery. Whenever we have a big emotional state come up, it will actually completely change what we consciously pay attention to. So be aware of that. Be aware that when you have an emotional state come up, your mind actually will even lie to you more and we'll do anything and everything to keep that emotional state alive. Um, we're constantly trying to reproduce things to keep whatever emotional state we're in uh, as the baseline. So usually if we're, if we have a, a sudden feeling of anger, um, your mind, as you probably can tell, if you look back at past experiences, will suddenly bring all kinds of thoughts and all kinds of what if scenarios and all kinds of different things coming at your mind all to keep that emotional anger um, alive, that emotional state alive. 
and those thoughts, those what if scenarios are completely fabricated. Mm -hmm. So understand if you have an emotional shift, your mind will lie to you to keep that emotion alive. This is very useful for good ones, but it's also very, um, it can be very um, negative for bad ones, you know, and that's, that's kind of the origination of why people have grudges and things like that. You know, something happened long ago. And now the person, every time they think of that person, or they see that person, they see the spouse of that person, they immediately get flooded with that emotion again. And they've got all these scenarios running in their head of what this awful person did. And chances are, it's a huge exaggeration of what happened. But yet that person is, is constantly holding a grudge against someone. And it's much more liberating to realize, hey, my mind is lying to me. It's doing things to keep that emotional state alive. Uh, and the things that it's telling me are not true. And when that happens, uh, that's where true liberation comes. And ultimately freedom from these kind of emotional states and these, you know, past traumas. All right, great. Okay, if you are not part of our subconscious healer group, I've posted the Facebook link below. Please join it. Um, we, we put a lot of posts in there. We have interaction. We have announcements and um, events posted in that group. Um, and if you haven't liked our page, please like our page. I'll put the link on that as well. We will be back in two weeks to answer more of your questions. So if you have questions before then, uh, please post them and we'll make sure that we are going to answer them. Um, it's a beautiful day out and the dogs are wanting us to come out to play. So everybody have a great day. Thank you.